All right, let's turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. We, uh, this is lesson number six, by the way, in our study on Calvinism. We're studying Calvinism not because we want to adopt that philosophical slash theological system. We're studying Calvinism so that we are better equipped to answer some of the claims that a Calvinist will make. Call it Reformed theology, however you wish to call it. Uh, this is a prevalent system of teaching. Uh, it has made inroads over the centuries, even today among, quote, evangelical churches. You find uh, this uh, reform theology uh, certainly not only taking root, but uh, literally blossoming, growing, and so forth. So anyway, this is lesson number six, and we're going to pick up looking at uh, unconditional election. And if you recall, last Sunday morning, we provided a definition of unconditional election right out of the mouth of those who believe in unconditional election. And uh, in summary, the idea behind unconditional election simply is that God in eternity past already chose, ordained, predetermined who would be saved onto eternal life. There are some terms that are used interchangeably, like predestination, of course, uh, or, uh, being ordained, being chosen. Um, so when we examine this doctrine of unconditional election, there are two questions we need to ask. Number one, uh, who is elected? And then, of course, it's important to ask, elected to what? And then, of course, the third follow-up question would be, well, how is anyone elected? So last Sunday morning, we, we sort of began looking at what is uh, taught uh, about unconditional election, and I hope uh, we saw that uh, ultimately there is one individual who has been elected, and, of course, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord was elected to be a Savior, not only a Savior for us, the body of Christ, but also a Savior for the nation of Israel. And what I wanted to emphasize last Sunday morning is the idea or the teaching, the doctrine of identification. When we look at election, it, it isn't... Uh, the idea of God individually electing or electing individuals as there is this corporate truth, this corporate identity. Uh, God has elected to form an agency. God has elected. He chose to create this one new man, this new creature. And it is this new creature that is the literal extension, if you will, of the Lord Jesus Christ. So anything that we get, anything that is uh, merited to us, anything that uh, we receive by way of blessing or inheritance is only possible because of an identity that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is, of course, critically important Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 1. So we're just going to pick up, and what I wanted to do this morning is look at the five principal passages used by Calvinists as proof texts, uh, texts that they would use to justify, to prove that God in eternity past by sovereign decree determined who goes to heaven, determines who will have eternal life. And as we commented last Sunday morning, then by default, anybody else who was not chosen, they're now left to suffer eternal, uh, uh, eternity in the lake of fire. And I know some Calvinists will soften that idea uh, by suggesting that, well, God never decreed anybody to hell. God never, uh, it's called dual predestination or double predestination, that God, he chooses who goes to heaven, but that doesn't mean he chose anyone to go to hell. Um, you know, that doesn't work too well. Uh, you may not make a choice, but that was your choice. <laughs> not making a choice is a choice. Uh, so uh, we're not going to dig the, into the weeds or anything like that. So uh, again, there are five key passages that are commonly used in defending the doctrine of unconditional election. So let's go through 
as many as we possibly can this morning. One of the big ones, Ephesians chapter 1. Again, verses 3 through 5. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Number one, we take note. The verse does not say that he hath chosen us to be in him. He has not chosen us into him. The verse says he hath chosen us in him. Jesus Christ is the agency. He is the instrument. He's the cause. He's the means by which God is going to accomplish his eternal purpose. Okay? So when we begin to study this idea of election, and if you recall verse 4, the word chosen is used interchangeably with the word elect or election. Okay? Don't get bent out of shape. Uh, it, they're used interchangeably. But again, the verse says that we are chosen in him. Whatever God has chosen to do, he accomplishes it in the Lord Jesus Christ. Over 30 times, or approximately 30 times, in the book of Ephesians, you read about in him, in Christ, in Christ Jesus, in Jesus Christ, by him, with him, through him. The book of Ephesians especially concentrates in and on the Lord Jesus Christ and anything and everything that God will ever achieve and accomplish for all of eternity is by way of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So what we, I think we already dealt with this last Sunday morning, we saw that we are intimately, eternally identified with and in the Lord Jesus Christ. So the choosing or this election has nothing to do with God's predetermined decree to select individuals onto eternal life. God has chosen to do something in his son. You and I have the we're given the the volition, the free will to choose to be in Christ or not. See, that's where things break down. We do believe in election. We do believe in God choosing to do something, choosing to accomplish something. The breakdown is we never find passages where God says, I've chosen you to life. Rather, we find passages about God choosing to do something. And then the appeal for the sinner to believe, to participate and to respond positively. If you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you now are identified with the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're part of God's elect purpose. Okay, Using a very, very rough analogy, I'll use it again. O'Hare Airport, American Airlines, they have a flight scheduled this afternoon to fly to Seattle. That has already been predetermined. American Airlines has already determined, uh, uh, I don't know, months, years ago, that flight is taking off. You can choose to buy the ticket or not, okay? So you can choose to respond to the claims of Almighty God. And if you say yes to what God says about His Son and the work of Calvary, you now are part of that predetermined purpose. So think about election, think about predestination, not in, in an individual sense, think about it in a corporate sense. And understand, it has nothing to do with determinism. The Calvinists will argue this doctrine of determinism, that God has determined what you do, where you're going, and what uh, function you're going to have. But think of it as identification with, okay? Uh, not individual, corporate, not determinism, but rather uh, identification with, okay? So right off the bat, verse 4, according as he has chosen us in him. So don't, don't neglect the doctrine of identification. Um, by the way, before the foundation of the world. Now, when we think about this choosing in 
him. The Calvinist, according to, to their theology, God in sovereign decree already made the, the decision e eons ago whether or not Don is going to heaven. Well, according to the Calvinist, anyone and everyone God has ever determined to have eternal life has already been chosen. That's according to Calvinism, right? Anyone and everyone that is ever going to go to heaven has already been determined and they've already been elected in eternity past. I want you to go to Romans chapter 16 and notice a, pass, a verse here that throws not, not just a monkey wrench, but throws a nuclear bomb at that. <laughs> in, in Romans chapter 16, look here at Romans chapter 16 and let's consider the language of verse 7. Romans chapter 16, verse 7. Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen, and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. Now, if you're going to adhere to this strict theological definition of being chosen, if you're a high Calvinist, garden variety Calvinist, classical Calvinist, According to verse 7, how are these individuals in Christ when? Before who? Well, wait a minute. According to Calvinist theology, God's already determined all of this when? In the past. So if you're a Calvinist, how do you handle these apostles who are in Christ before Paul. Are you in Christ in eternity past? See, a Calvinist would say, oh, God already determined that. So this verse is rather difficult. When you, talk, when you think about being chosen in Him, when you talk about or when you look at the issue of being in Christ, you have a hard time arguing it's already been done and already predetermined. Because that verse says these individuals had it before Paul. So being in him is the result of a decision that one makes. You don't have to be in him. Or you can choose to be in him. What do you do with the gospel message is, is ultimately what's going on. I go back to Ephesians chapter 4. So being in Christ... Um, isn't something that has already happened in eternity past. Case in point, Romans 16, verse 7. You got those that are in him before Paul got in him. But we also need to point out in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be, now, what has God chosen to do in Jesus Christ? that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. We're going to, we're going to, in a few minutes, we're going to look at a verse. The word holy, the idea of being sanctified, the idea of being set apart, that verse is telling us whatever it is God, God's chosen to do something in his son, in his son, God's purpose is to create a, an agency which is holy and without blame. To be holy carries the idea of being sanctified. We're going to find, we'll go to that verse in a second. We're called to be saints. Well, I'll tell you what, let's go there right now. Keep your finger here. Go to um, 1 Corinthians. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The, chosen for what? That would be the question. What is it? We know who. Uh, it's in Christ. But chosen for what? What does it mean for God to choose us as a corporate agency to be holy? It carries with it the idea of being separated for a very specific and unique purpose. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and notice verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, 
to them that are sanctified where? To be what? Sanctified. In Christ, we are what? Sanctified. Can I ask you this? Were the Corinthians living sanctified lives? Were they living as separate, distinct, unique individuals set apart for God's exclusive use? Quickly, go to chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. What I'm getting at is this. What Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 is emphasizing, it's not emphasizing God's predetermined purpose to give you life. God's predetermined purpose in Christ to make you set apart, sanctified, holy, unique, so that he now is going to accomplish his eternal purpose. We are sanctified in Christ. Remember, in Christ, we're sanctified. But remember what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Um, we, we need to begin reading at verse 9. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 11. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. In the name, but listen, the Corinthians are carnal, right? Remember chapter 3, you are, are you not carnal and walk as men? And Paul actually begins to list all of the carnal behavior, yet... Are they sanctified in the name of Jesus? They're in Christ. Now, their behavior is not matching the divine vocation and high calling that they have as holy and without blemish and as sanctified. God has, has chosen to place those Corinthians uh, uh, in he didn't choose the Corinthians to be in Christ. He's chosen in Christ to declare the Corinthians sanctified, yet their lives are anything but set apart. So the point is this. We'll go back to Ephesians chapter four, uh, 1. Ephesians chapter uh, 1. Keep that in mind. When verse 4 starts describing what is the purpose God had in Christ. Verse 4, according as he has chosen us, in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. God is setting the believer apart. It's not emphasizing, hey, I've determined to give you life on an individual basis all the way uh, in eternity past. Verse 5, keep reading, having predestinated us, now again, a Calvinist using their theological lens, well, you see God's predetermined whether or not you're going to have life. But, but keep reading, having predestinated us onto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ. You can't escape by Christ, in him, with him, through him. It's Christ. He's the elect agency. And God's chosen to do something in him. Verse 5, onto the adoption of children. Why is the word, it doesn't say having predestinated us to be children. It doesn't say that, does it? Why does the scripture, why does God deliberately use the word adoption? Could he have not said having predestinated us onto children? to be sons of God, the, there's a reason that the word adoption of children, notice it doesn't say having predestinated us onto the adoption as children. It's the adoption of children. God's predetermined purpose has something to do with God's purpose in placing the believer into a very special, unique place of privilege, a unique place 
of, of, uh, of benefit and, and status. It has everything to do with position. If you go to Galatians chapter 4, Galatians chapter 4. I hope what we're trying to demonstrate is don't read the verses using this the theological lens called Calvinism. The verses are are developing. They're they're beginning to amplify. And when the language of choosing election and ordination and, and predestination is used, it, it specifically what is it referring to? The predestination has to do with the adoption of sons. Galatians chapter 4. Galatians 4 provides a wealth of detail about the adoption. Remember, it's not the idea of being placed into the family. We're already in the family. It has to do with a status of rank and a position of authority within the family. That's what an adoption is, by the way. An adoption, we're not going to go back into Roman history, but, but it, it, it doesn't matter. You don't have to go to Roman history. Uh, to be adopted has everything to do with a legal status that grants the son to liberally exercise authority. Look at verse 1 of Galatians 4. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, Though he be what? Lord of all. Is it possible to be the Lord, small l? Okay, we understand that. What does it mean to be Lord of all? Yet, this kid is handicapped. What Paul is doing is he's describing not someone who now is granted a position of relationship as a family member, but rather is given a position in the family. You have a son, a child, verse 1. You have a child who is an heir. He is Lord of all. But is this child free to independently exercise authority? Absolutely not. That child is no different than a what? A servant. The word adoption has everything to do with the placement of the child within the ranks of the family. And that's what Galatians is now going to address. Verse 2 but is under tutors and governors. and So is under tutors and governors. What, what is the purpose of tutors and governors? Uh, by the way, they're two different offices. A tutor, tutelage, a tutor is educating, a tutor is empower, a tutor is teaching, a governor. Remember, they used to have, well, I guess they still have governors on, I think uh, semi, tractor trailers, they have governors. Uh, and the carburetors, if they have carburetors anymore, everything's fuel injection, I understand. But the idea of to govern, to, to, it, it, there's a controlling element. A tutor is teaching, but a governor provides a restraining, controlling influence on behavior and activity. Uh, we had women here who were governesses. A governess is the watchdog. Well, it, it watches over. So here you have an heir, he's a child, he's Lord of all, but somebody else is telling him what to do. You get the picture that's being painted here. I mean, big deal, you're an heir, you're Lord of all, but somebody's got to tell you what to do, when to do it, how to do it, and, and you've got to have a tutor that's going to systematically educate and and. and uh, uh, teach you something, right? That's a problem. Because that is not what God predetermined to do with all those who are in Jesus Christ today. Verse 2 again, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the who. So the father has a child. Is the child a child of the father. Is there a relationship between the child and the father? Absolutely. 
But now there's a time appointed. By the way, the dispensation of grace is the time that God has appointed to declare his children, those who believe today, to be adopted. See, it isn't God. There are, I've heard some people suggest, well, uh, you know, Charlotte, maybe one day God will choose to adopt you. Yeah, it has nothing to do with this uh, point in time where you reach a level of advanced understanding. And if it, listen, the time appointed to the Father happened 2,000 years ago. Anyone who believes today in the dispensation of the grace of God is given a place of privilege and of rank and of authority within the family. In other words, God is never going to te- treat us as a bunch of children under tutors and governors no different than a servant. That to me is remarkable. That is remarkable. I, I, I Go to John chapter 15. Keep your finger in Galatians 4. I hope you, you grasp what the book of Galatians is doing. Somebody, tell me, what's the problem at Galatia? One word, law. Is Paul saying, isn't it a joy to have the law when he writes Galatians? Or is Paul rather worked up? And is Paul rather, you know, Paul actually says from henceforth, I don't want you bothering me anymore. Is Paul happy writing to the Galatians? Paul is, I'm not saying he's angry, but, but Paul, he's, he's rebuking. And, and Paul is a bit outraged. He says, I, I'm, I'm, how are you so soon removed? What happened? Something went wrong at Galatia. And the problem is, they began to adhere to the law program. Why? So we need to keep that in mind when Paul says, do you understand that if you live under the precepts of the law program, you're no different than a servant under tutors. and You know how the law functioned? A tutor and a governor, the, the elements uh, of the world, Paul says, uh, uh, the beggarly elements of the world. The law was a system that told you what to do, when to do it, how to do it, and if you violate it, and if you uh, 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 disobey, any infraction of the law would be met with punishment. It would be met with chastisement. Or, if through faithful obedience to the law program, it would be met with reward. That's how a child relates to the father. We, have our, we had our three-year-old last night. And, um, you know, it's what a study in psychology. It's, it's really a lot of fun. But, but, but you understand, a three-year-old wants to get away with a bunch of things. So are we mean old grandparents when we have to sort of restrain a three-year-old from doing stupid things which could lead to their harm? You, you understand. I mean, we let little Justice out in the back porch, and you think it could be a problem if we let him go down the stairs? I mean, you understand. So anyway, the law, as a tutor and a governor, controlled, restricted, and dictated Israel. They were servants when under the law program. Paul is writing Galatians and he's trying to emphasize, wait a minute, that is not how God the Father is going to relate with any one of us today in the dispensation of grace. What does it mean to be a servant? John chapter 15, verse 15. John 15, 15. Henceforth, I call you not servants. Why? For the servant knoweth not what his Lord what? So is, is the servant handicapped? Well, does the servant know what his Lord is doing? No. Going back to Galatians chapter 4, the doctrine of adoption tells us that God does not want us operating in limited understanding. We don't operate in ignorance, but God the Father has revealed to us the eternal counsels of His will. And more than that, He's expecting us to enter into the halls of wisdom. 
I, I, we, we got to appreciate why Paul is going after the Galatians. The Galatians, by going back to the milk bottle, by going back to the, the milk principles, by going back to the system of bondage called the law, you're operating like a bunch of servants. You're operating ignorantly. The servant does not know what his master or Lord is doing. That is no excuse for a believer today. When God says, He's made known unto us the manifold wisdom of His will and of His good pleasure. What the reason God has appointed the dispensation, the grace of God, as an opportunity for the believers today not only to recognize and understand what is the counsels of His will, but now as adopted sons, He expects us to live, respond, and react according to the eternal counsel of his will. Uh, shame on the Galatians. Oh, I've got to travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Galatians chapter 4, verse 2. But is under tutors and governors until the time appointed to the Father, even so we, when we were children. But don't forget verse 1. The child is an heir, Correct. The child is the Lord of all, but yet is hindered, doesn't have the, the freedom or the authority to operate independently. Verse 3, even so when we were children, we're in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the what? Adoption of, not as, the adoption of sons. The doctrine of adoption takes the believer, the one who is already a child, the one who is already in the forever family of Almighty God, and places us into a position of responsibility, into a position of adulthood, into a position where that son now can take the counsels of God, the information that the Father provides, and now can actively engage in the very labor, work, and ministry that the Heavenly Father is doing. That's what the adoption is all about. Paul goes on, verse 5, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons, and because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son in your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore? Thou art no more a servant. But what about the servant? He can be an, a child. He could be an heir. He can be Lord of all. But the relationship has changed. No longer an infant. That is now a liability. But an adult who now contributes and is actively engaged in all that the Father is instructing him. That's why we have this spirit which cries, Abba, Father. The, that expression, never forget, and I know historically and traditionally, when the Lord Jesus Christ, remember when he cried, Abba, Father? And I know tradition teaches that that's sort of the son, uh, that, that's sort of like saying, Daddy. But, but they leave it as though, oh, Daddy, as though where the child kind of appealing to the protection. And, and as a child, we're, we're saying daddy, as one who still functions and operates as, as a child who is limited in, in understanding. When Jesus Christ three times cried, Abba, Father, he was a 33-year-old adult. He wasn't crying daddy as one who's appealing to the protective hand or one who is appealing to limited understanding. The idea of crying father, it comes from the voice of one who, who was an adult and one who cried out the father and then what did he say? Oh, that this cup would pass, nevertheless not my will be done, but thy Abba Father, I know what your will is. And I willfully choose to carry it out. Jesus was not a servant. He didn't cry out a father as an infant. He was a full-grown adult 
in complete control of his senses and his understanding. And what the Lord chose to do is, I will, willfully and joyfully, I might add, delightfully, do what the Father's telling me to do. Okay? That's what it means to be adopted. Verse 7, Wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. The adoption of children carries with it the idea of position, not so much relation. When Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5 tells us that we've been predestinated unto the adoption of children, you know what God predetermined to do with all those who believe in Jesus Christ and are now eternally identified and united in Him? God says, I've determined that I will not treat you like children under the law. I'm going to treat you like adults because I'm going to reveal everything that you need to, to know so that you can function, serve, worship, and operate as an adult. That's what God's predetermined to do. Why do I say all that? What does the Calvinist say? Oh, he predetermined Charlotte to go to heaven. How do you read that into Go to Romans chapter 8. Let's go to Romans chapter 8, which is uh, the, another major proof text, uh, another passage that is used. Because here we also read about adoption. And uh, Romans chapter 8, and, and also we're going to read about predestination. Romans chapter 8, verse 15. Romans chapter 8, verse 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. That's a reference to the law, by the way. But ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Father. Again, we've been placed into position as sons. We have the same spirit that possessed the Lord Jesus Christ. We cry what? Abba, Father, not Daddy, 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 help me. But rather, dear Heavenly Father, I know what your will is. And I choose to do it. That's what an adult does. I don't look at my three-year-old grandson and, and say, I give you the opportunity to choose. To do. No, you know, I got to tell him, don't do it. Stop it. He took the ball and he kept throwing at his one-year-old brother. Now, now I got to tell you, Jude is a tough little kid. I tell you, he's getting hit in the head and he's laughing. But, you know, I'm, I'm getting a little nervous, you know. So... I didn't say, hey, Justice, do you understand that, you know, the force that you're throwing the ball will cause potential damage and injury to a one-year-old and, and, you know, perhaps DCFS is going to... I'm not going to do that. You know what I told my three-year-old grandson? Stop it. And then you know what he did? He picked up the ball again and he threw it. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. You know. And so I had to then literally physically take the ball and then literally physically remove justice from the, you know, from the area, lest he kills his little brother. So, um, and it, you don't, I wouldn't do that to Sherry, 61, uh, I, <laughs> 16, you know, she's only 16. <laughs> uh, you, don't tell her I said home. But, but Sherry's an adult, Okay. I'm not going to treat her that way. You understand. I'm not trying to insult. But here's the same spirit of adoption whereby we cry intelligent. Intelligent, comprehensive understanding. Verse 16, the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs, what? With Christ. Now, let's, let's look at this next major uh, quote, proof text. Drop down to verse 28, okay? Verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, moreover whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. So here we go. Now we have the Calvinist who will take verses 28 through verse 30 and create a doctrinal system called Ordo Salutis, that is the order of salvation. 
And because of theology, their theological system, they will argue and insist that what God in his eternal decree predetermined to do is divinely select individuals onto eternal life. They read this entire section as though that's what it's talking about. So now you have words like called, you have words like predestinated, you have words like foreknow, and, and, and so forth, and, and they only, they limit all of those language, uh, terms uh, to individual soul salvation. What is going on in this particular passage, okay? This is not some order of salvation, what is going on? Let's start at verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. When we get into the so-called sovereignty of God, we'll, we'll look at the all things, okay? But the all things can only be understood in its context, okay? And Paul's going to begin to, to amplify uh, what these all things are. But let's read verse 28 carefully. And we know that all things work together for good to them that... What? Wait a minute, how come all things aren't working together for them that God has already elected or already ordained or already chosen or already predetermined unto eternal life? Do you notice there's something that God's doing and all things are working together to them that what? That love God. Wait a minute, how come it doesn't say whom God loves? Now, now think about how a Calvinist thinks. God in his sovereign grace has already predetermined whom uh, he will love. And because he's predetermined whom uh, he will love, he then ordains them eternal life. And now that he's ordained them unto eternal life, he's going to have to regenerate them. He's going to have to give them the new birth so that they now can believe, they can now be sanctified, so on and so forth. But that expression, them that love God, that also, for me, totally undermines Calvinist theology. Love. Go to John chapter 5. To them that love God. Um, go to John chapter 5. And, and here's a, a great passage that will, will describe those, those who love God. John chapter 5, let's begin at verse 38. John chapter 5, verse 38. John chapter 5, verse 38. And ye have not his word abiding in you. For whom he hath sent him... Ye believe not. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come to me. Wait a minute. The Lord Jesus, he isn't using like language like, you know, God already predetermined that you're going to operate in hindrance and that through stiffness of heart and hardness of heart, there is no possible way for you to ever believe in me. You see, that's how a Calvinist thinks. Remember, remember, we're not going to go back there to Matthew. Uh, remember that fascinating passage where the Lord Jesus, he deliberately spoke in parables. Why? Lest they believe and be converted, and have their sins forgiven. Is it possible for someone to believe and be converted and have their sins forgiven? Yeah. Well, yeah. Otherwise, why would the Lord deliberately speak in a system called parables? So that's a scary, that's a frightening passage when you're dealing with a Calvinist. Because in the thinking of the Calvinist, wait, those that are without, those that are the unbelievers, those who are wicked, that's the eternal decree of God. So why would God, in the midst of those without, why would God, or the Lord Jesus, in the midst of those who are without, why would the Lord be afraid of speaking plainly? Because they might get saved. But they're without. They're the wicked. 
They're the unbeliever. So Jesus, to ensure they remain without, he speaks in parables. Boy, foreign is any language about any God's eternal decree. Let me put it this way. If God already determined that the wicked are lost, I can tell you whatever you want, but if God's already determined and decreed that you are without, you will forever be what? Without. Who cares what you will ever say? Jesus didn't do that. He said, you're without. You're the wicked. So I'm not going to speak plainly. Because if I do, you're going to believe. And if you believe, you're going to be converted. Do do you understand what's happening here? So when the Lord Jesus here in John chapter 5, he he places the Otis, the responsibility on his audience. The problem is you will not believe. Verse verse 38, um, verse 30, "For, for ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he has sent, him ye believe, you're not believing it. Verse 40, and ye will not come to me that ye might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you that ye have not the love of God in you. Why don't they have the love of God? Verse 38, and ye have not his what? Word abiding in you. For him he has sent, ye what? Believe not. Verse 40, and ye will not come that ye might have what? You know what? Those who love God are those who respond positively to the claims and to the teaching that is the word. It has nothing to do with God's preordained decree. They that love God are the ones who said, I believe it. I receive it. I, 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 they have the word. It isn't God who supernaturally deposits it in them. Whosoever will. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's the word of God which effectually worketh in you. It's God's word which is a seed that works. You see, the power of the gospel is the gospel. The power of the gospel is the gospel. God's word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So they that love God are the ones who respond positively. They hear the claims of God. They hear God's word. By the way, where is God's word? Verse 39, search the what? There's where the word of God is. You see, that separates those who, they believe what the scriptures are saying. They believe what the scriptures are teaching. Those who love God, they believe it. Go to Ephesians chapter 6, because this is an interesting verse in that regard. They that love God, Ephesians chapter 6. They that love God are the ones who honor, value, and, and, and uh, they esteem the word of God. So it's quite interesting when you start looking at all things work together. It doesn't say God, all things work together according to divine decree. All things work together for good to them that what? Them that are responding positively to what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying. Uh, well, or what the word of God is saying, all right? In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 24. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in what? Sincerity. Now, it's fascinating. Paul is distinguishing a group of people in the midst of the Ephesian church. Go to chapter 1. Go to chapter 1. In chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Think about that for a second. Is it possible to be a saint and not be faithful? Well, Paul says it's required in the Sur that a man be found what? 
faithful. Is it possible to be a child of God, to be a saint, but maybe not faithful? So when Paul ends Ephesians, he's addressing this specific group within the ranks of the church. Chapter 6, verse 24. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. It's not all believers love in sincerity. Paul's addressing those who are faithful, who value the instruction, who value the doctrine. Let's take the idea, let's take the teaching of adoption of sons. Were the Galatians being faithful as adopted sons? Of course not. Else why would Paul have to teach them that doctrine? The Galatians, they were serving as servants, as children, under tutors and governors, under the, the beggarly elements of the world. Oh, you observe days and times and seasons. And, and Paul says, I'm afraid of you guys. They're not being faithful. They have, they, Paul says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace. The Galatians were not faithful. They're still part of the body of Christ. What I'm saying is this. Not all members of the body of Christ will love the Lord Jesus in sincerity. Now, that doesn't mean you don't love him as a savior. But it's talking about being a faithful lover of the teaching and of the doctrine. Go back to Romans chapter 8. So the group that Paul now begins to address. And, and you know why? Put it this way. Put, let's, let's read it this way. Romans chapter 8 verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. So let's say you reject the counsels of God. Let's say you do not value the teaching of Scripture. And I'm talking about you're a son, okay? Let's say you're saved. You're just like the Corinthians. Are you not carnal and walk as men? And you remember what the problem was at Corinth. They were walking as men in, in what sense? They were valuing and esteeming human wisdom, the philosophy of this world. You know, where's the, the, where's the, the wise and the scribe and, and the debater and all of that? The Corinthians, they loved Greek culture, Greek wisdom, and, and Greek human wisdom. Okay, so Paul, he, he identifies them as being carnal, correct? So would the Corinthian know how to properly respond and react to whatever happens in life if they're rejecting God's word. No, no. So let's read verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. If you don't know how to react, are all things working good for you? Now, now think about this. It doesn't, all things work together for good to who? Them. So if you're a child, for example, and go to Romans, here's an example. Go to Romans chapter 5. Go to Romans chapter 5. So, so let's pretend that you choose to go to heaven. I'm going to heaven. My sins are forgiven. Thank you, Lord, but I'm just going to live the way I want to live. I don't really care about, you know, being a, you know, whatever, and, and you know what, I, I don't even believe in right division and, you know, that whole mid dispensational stuff and so on and so on and so on and so forth. So if we are ill-equipped, if we're unedified, if we are properly, properly uh, instructed in what God is doing today and how God is working today, when things go wrong, for example, I can pull a verse out of James and I can pull that verse that says, hey, anybody sick? Pray. Call the elders. Get anointed with oil. Because the prayer of faith shall, what? Heal thee. 
Now remember, I'm an immature believer that I don't really care for all this Paul line, Paul, 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 rightly dividing, mid ex dispensationalism. all you guys are riding on. Of course, you know what? I like what James has to say about calling the elders and getting anointed with oil. You know why? Because the prayer of faith, it's going to heal me. Hey, didn't Jesus say, ask and ye shall receive? I like that verse. If I had faith like a mustard seed, I can remove what? Mountains. I can drink any deadly thing, and it shall not harm thee. Is it dangerous being ignorant of God's word? So if you don't love God and value and desire to be instructed and to be taught and to learn the deep things of God, are all things going to work for good when tragedy strikes, when calamity strikes? And an uneducated believer, Paul says, you reap what you sow. And you have, for example, Romans chapter 5, verse 3, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. It will an it will a well-educated believer today in the dispensation of grace who rightly divides the word of truth and understands the dispensation of life, will they be able to glory in tribulations? Wouldn't a well-educated believer know how to properly re react to the tribulation? So will tribulation work good for me if I know how to react and respond? If you're a childlike believer who is ignorant of what God is doing and when calamity strikes, will that calamity work good in your life? Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Gosh, we didn't even get into that whole order, ordo salutis, did we? But I just, why is it that Paul... He's talking about them that love God. The one who loves God is the one who values the instruction that God is giving. When we're educated, we have an entire different understanding of what's happening. Now, in Romans 8, we know something about the bondage of corruption. We know something, and we're going to go back there and close, but 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Look at verse 15. For all things are for your sakes. Now, we understand in the context, right? Verse 8, we're troubled. Uh, verse 9, we're persecuted. Verse 10, always bearing about in the body, right? The dying. Man, that's, that's horrible stuff. I mean, going around now, always bearing about in the, the body, the dying. Verse 15, for all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. How in the world will the calamities that Paul is experiencing in his life and ministry, how does that redound to the glory of God? How does persecution, how does affliction, how does uh, um, uh, the heartache and the distress, how do all of those things redound? We don't have time. That's a special word. To the glory of God. Because Paul knew how to respond properly. If a child starts to cry, beg, plead, does that redound to the glory of God? If God says, listen, the, the tribulation, it does something productive. It achieves something. It is something you can glory in. You can value it. You can honor it. You don't have to fear it. Trouble is no longer an enemy. If you don't properly respond, you're calling God a liar. Think about that. Paul, doesn't he say he's troubled in verse 8? Doesn't he say that we're perplexed? Doesn't he say we're persecuted? Doesn't he say we're cast down? Doesn't he say I'm burying my body the marks? And, and if Paul chose to say, not fair, in unjust, God, where are you? Why are you doing this to me? Why are you punishing me? Why would he? Will that glorify God? 
If, if Paul fell on his knees, I mean, what if you want to claim, James? I got to call the elder born. I got them. I got to get them to pour olive oil all over me. Does that glorify God? Does it glorify God when the believer rips passages out of the Old Testament and say, I'm going to believe it and I'm going to live it or re- takes passages? That's not how God's glorified. You know how God is glorified? God is glorified when a well-educated believer responds the way God intends the believer to respond. Listen, calamity in life can destroy you as a believer. But if you know how to properly respond, it redounds to the glory of God. Now, go back to Romans chapter 8. When, we, when we're looking at, and we will look at all things that are working together for good, right? To them that love God. They that love God, they, they have a, a, an understanding of some things, okay? Now, let's look there at verse 17, Romans 8, 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer. Wait a minute. A well-educated believer isn't going to resist suffering. Is that the proper response? To resist it? Or is the proper response so that we may suffer with him, that we may be also glorified. Where's the glory? The glory is in the suffering. Verse 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Listen, God's given us the first fruits of something that's going to happen in eternity. The point is this. You love God's word. You honor God's word. You value what God's instructing us today as a heavenly father who says you're not under the law. You're adopted. I've given you a position. And as, and, and as a son of God, as an adult within the family, we are given the responsibility to let the father personally educate us And if we understand what God is doing, I know how to properly react and respond. And there isn't anything in life that can ever defeat me. But if I'm a babe and I'm there in the Sermon of the Mount and I don't know how to properly respond and react to whatever the circumstance and situation is, listen, it doesn't redound to the glory of God. You're calling God a liar. Now, they're babies. I understand that. But for a Christian to confess their sins, for a Christian to beg God to change the physical circumstance, is to call God a liar. Because that isn't what God is doing. And you know, the situation, instead of being the the channel through which eternal glory can be achieved, it becomes the cause of defeat. And discouragement. Now, we're going to stop. Go back to verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. We know something about what's happening. And there isn't anything in life that can defeat. We're more than conquerors. By the way, that's how Paul's going to end chapter 8, right? We are more than conquerors through him. Now, we're gonna, we'll, we'll pick it all up again because this is a real big passage that Calvinists will use. To them who are the called. Now, you know what a Calvinist does? You see, he's called us onto eternal life. Again, they're reading, doc, they're reading stuff into the passage. To them who are the called according to his purpose. What are we called to And that's what we'll look at next time, all right? Father, again, we do thank you for your love. We do thank you for your grace. We thank you, Father, for uh, who we are, what you're doing through Christ. And, Lord, as we progress through uh, some of this information, we understand how it is you're working and what your ultimate aim and purpose is. And we thank you that we're a part of it, not because of anything we've done, but because of all that Christ Jesus has already done on our behalf. And we thank you for in Christ's name. Amen.